Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Thanks for tuning in. You'll notice that we're missing Jax today. Jax, hope you're having a great time in Texas. But nonetheless, we have a wonderful show planned for you today. So honored to have a fellow cyber chick joining us, Chloe Mizdagi, an accomplished security executive, thought leader, podcaster, public speaker, board member, and a huge advocate within the cybersecurity community. She's been recognized as one of the 50 cybersecurity leaders who helped shape 2020, a power player by SC Media Women in IT Security, Cybersecurity Woman of the Year, Business Insiders, Power Player in Cybersecurity, Cybersecurity Advocate of the Year, among many, many others. We're going to bring Chloe on. Chloe, thank you for coming on the show. So excited to have you back. Oh, thanks for having me back. That was quite an intro. Girl, I, I think we could go on for another 30 minutes with all of your ex, with all of your super extensive accolades. So honored, huge fan. Love to have you back. It's definitely been a while since we last had you on the show, since you and I last caught up. Um, Want to, you know, for those that haven't heard from you before, those that may be tuning in um, since we've rebranded. Could you give our listeners, our audience, a little bit of a quick intro on your background? Maybe yeah. things that I didn't touch on in that intro. Oh, I mean, I feel like you touched on everything. Um, but I would say that I entered the InfoSec space in about 2017, and I've been in it since. Got in through vulnerability management. Then I got into the bug bounty space and then uh, gamification space in cybersecurity and then education front, and then now I'm in AIML security. And all that started with was someone who basically was working with nonprofits and startups and tech. And then I ended up landing in cybersecurity by pure chance. I love that. You've held so many roles. I mean, looking at like just your profile, head of strategy, chief strategist, managing partner, chief impact officer, CEO, founder, head of threat research, I mean, you really did find like your niche in the cyberspace. And um, there's got to be a lot of different contributing factors, you know, that helped kind of take you there. If you had to give some advice to anybody listening to this, it's like, hey, maybe I haven't found my niche yet. What would be that piece of advice that kind of helped you get to that sweet spot that you're in now? I think when I started to get to know myself better, that's when kind of things lined up in a sense because I started trusting myself. I started believing in myself and figuring out like, what are the things I'm good at? And then also, you know, being able to see myself where I started recognizing that imposter syndrome was something that was holding me back, but it's kind of like an artificial thing because the reason we have imposter syndrome is the lack of representation. And so channeling the frustration, the anger, the things that I hear and see and, and being like, how do I make this better? And also understand how that directly affects me and others. So I think the more I got to know myself, the better I was able to figure out, okay, what is my, what are things I'm good at? What are things that I can improve on? And then taking it there because no one's perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you strive for perfection, you will fail miserably and be disappointed time and time again. So I like that approach of just being self-aware, doing that introspection and figuring out, you know, what are the next what are the next steps? And and being open-minded to try that new role or to try that 
um, you know, new technology and get your hands dirty, roll up those sleeves and figure it out. See, see how you like it. Yeah. Um, so I know that you were recently at DEF CON, Black Hat, Squad CON. I've been following, I've been following <laughs> all of the things that you've been up to. And, and obviously you've been really focused on the AI, ML, security, bug bounty hunting side of the house. Um, can you share with us regarding some of these challenges around mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, machine learning, how are organizations um, needing to adjust? Like what are those trends that you're seeing? What are the ed top education points that you think that people need to be looking out for? Yeah, I went in a Black Hat DEF CON thinking like, you know, we'll be more prepared to have further conversations other than chat GPT as a security problem. Um, and then when I realized when I was there was that every single person that I talked to was only talking about chat GPT or also we call it like LLMs. And this made me very concerned because what that means is that us in the security space is that we are we are ill-equipped at this time. When it comes to AI ML, none of us know how that's built or designed. So how are we supposed to secure something we don't know how it works or the foundations of it? I think the thing that frightens me the most is that there's a lot of influencers out there that keep talking about AI and security when in reality, they're really just talking about chat GPT. And that's just like one part. Uh, AI is really broad. Um, but there's other things we need to be concerned about. I remember when I first got this role at Protect AI, I started interviewing folks that work in this space. And the things that kept them up at night was the fact that there's this thing called like data poisoning. So for example, say that, you know, you have taught this model that every time that it sees like a Russian tank that this drone would fire at a Russian tank because it has image recognition. But say if you got someone to come in and change what that image is, say to a school bus, that becomes a lot more scary, right? And I know usually when we talk about data poisoning, we think of the red light, green light, that it can take a threat actor to come in and like change the light to a different color, causing a situation or a crash. But I think of like the bigger situations where people are going to become victim because us in security, we're just talking in circles and instead not admitting we don't know. I think that's the one thing that scares me the most is that I kept seeing that at DEF CON and Black Hat. Yeah, it seems like there's been a laser focus on like a few trendy things. I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk and just spill, spill it. Go for it. Go for that's it. That's how it is, right? It's like, yeah, oh, GPT. I mean even in like the audit and compliance space, right? Like our, like where I play in my, my customers are coming to me and you know, their, their buzzwords are blockchain, crypto, AI, ML. I'm like, okay, do you guys know what these things are? Right. It's like that education aspect. Right. And then not knowing how to secure things that you don't necessarily understand. And then on the flip side, right? Like on the consulting side, how can we help our customers and guide them to bolster security? How do we see, allow them to see risk from that larger scale and not just like, hey, what's, what's trendy and what are you hearing about? But thinking ahead and thinking of everything that's to come. And if you don't have the right things built in from the design perspective, then, I mean, you're toast, right? Like how, so how are you toast. going to then, how are you then going to like backpedal and try to create things that weren't there? Um, gosh, I mean, chat GPT, don't even get me started on that <laughs> one because I know Jackson, I always talk about that because uh, we see, you know, thought leadership coming out through that and, and it's like reviewed and signed off by somebody, right? But I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. So, um, you know, organizations are now combating that with coming out with AI policies and like banning all of these types of tools from being utilized in the workplace. And it's more so, I feel like from a place of fear, right? Like it we're is. just going to ban them because we just don't want to mess with it. And we don't want to play in the space and we don't want to open up that room for risk. Yes, it is. It is one of those things because once you you give this product to the world that can make their life easier and help their job better, you know, in some ways, like think about how we don't have enough hours in a week, but we have so many things deliverables. 
so chat GPT kind of becomes your assistant and it says to help you get it done and then companies to take it away from you when you've already started using it and it's been implemented and there hasn't been problems before it's kind of weird you're like yeah. you're like look at this pretty thing i've used it it works really well but now i can't use it also how would they know like that's the other thing that goes through my mind how would they know that's a very good point there are workarounds <laughs> there it's are called workarounds. a personal computer <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, so it is actually, this is, I mean, this is pretty surprising for me, um, knowing how wide scale these conferences are and that you walked in and that was like one of the alarming takeaways. It is so, incredibly scary. Uh, well, these things have to obviously, um, you know, come from the top. Like we got to start exposing people and educating them. Do you have any like resources off the yeah. top of your mind that you could share with us um, so that yeah. we, can, we can, you know, start to spread the word and hopefully that's a trickle downstream effect. Yeah. So um, during DEF CON week or Hacker Summer Camp or whatever we would call it, Black Hat, um, that week we launched a the first ever AI ML bug bounty platform. So people all around the world can go and find vulnerabilities and report it on there, get paid out. And we believe in like paying people the right amount. I think a lot of the times when it comes to bug bounty companies, they don't pay out the researchers well enough for the hard work that they've done. And we want to make sure that we give them, you know, good rewards. But also when you find vulnerabilities in AI and ML, they're pretty darn scary. So they should get paid out a lot more, in my opinion. Um, so we launched a platform that does that so people can go in our Discord, hang out and everything. But additionally, we come out with content teaching you how to hack certain AI and ML. So that's pretty cool. And we're going to continue to keep educating the community and being there because I think that this may be one of those situations where no one's really in the space. So that yeah. means no one should experience imposter syndrome because no one knows what they're <laughs> doing in this space. So just think about it. Like, no matter who you are, your background, you're welcome because no one else knows what they're doing quite yet. And it's good. Jump in the, head first. We're, right? Yep. <laughs> and that's what that's that's how we start solving things. We learn from our mistakes and we learn as we practice and we go. And that's what this is going to be all about is a lot of learning. You know what? People were talking about the cloud this way years and years ago, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. So I'm definitely going to get these resources from you offline. I'm going to put them in the show notes. So anybody that's tuning in, that's like, yeah, I want to get my hands dirty. I want to start getting my hands into this educational content. We're going to provide that. Uh, so thank you, Chloe. Yeah. I'm going to pivot a little bit. So along with other things that you've been up to, um, I've been keeping up with those chats around climate change and sustainability and the need for the resilient future and diving into that intersection where InfoSec meets the sustainability. What are some of those things that we as individuals or our organizations that we work for or even organizational leaders that might be hearing this right now, um, what can they do to start trending towards that positive impact? And I know that's a loaded question. I know that you've <laughs> given talks on this, um, but you know, in a cliff note version, what are some actionable steps that we can take? Yeah, I would say that almost in every industry these days, the talk of climate change and the impact that it has on industries is something that's pretty out there. Um, but then when it comes to InfoSec or cybersecurity, there hasn't been any. So during the pandemic, one of the things you know I started recognizing was concerns about climate change threats. Um, one of those was because, you know, in, in the Bay Area in 2020, there was a massive fires. And so when you opened your curtains, everything was orange and red. And it was a Photoshop, those images. And it was surreal and it scared me. It also scared me when later that year I flew somewhere and I saw a bunch of land just completely dry where it used to be, you know, mm -hmm. where they would have rain. Um, and then if you just look at just recently, like in California, we had a hurricane, a tropical storm, which is unheard of. Um, and I think the thing that's so hard to understand is how come in our industry, we're not talking about it. And I always think of uh, 
you know, we don't talk about Bruno. That song always plays yeah, in my head. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Because that's really what it is. It's like no one's talking about it. I remember when I started researching, you know, like no one's done research in this space yet. No one's given talks about it. No one has even written about it. So I started doing that. Um, and it's finally picking up. It took two years to start getting where I am right now on that front. But it is one of those things that makes me concerned because still no one else is talking about it. And being the only one in the room also makes you kind of a target sometimes. And so that's the one thing I would say is kind of frustrating is that people are scared to talk about it with their colleagues because of the political situation that now climate change exists in when it shouldn't be political because it's almost the same argument if the the earth is flat. Like we have had evidence since the seventies, climate change exists, it's happening. Yep. And, you know, when I give these talks, I try to make it as tangible as possible. I share all the data possible because I know if I don't, people won't take it seriously. Um, but I also know it's also a coping mechanism for people to not want to take on that. There's this thing called eco grief. So it's mm -hmm. like when you're grieving, you know, you're still like in denial before you go through different series. And I think that's kind of what's going on for some folks. That's interesting. So it's a taboo topic because people don't want to accept that this is a real thing. This is yeah. this is something that's actually happening day to day. And I and obviously, I mean, it goes without saying, like us being in the technology sector. We aren't environmental scientists. This isn't like part of our day to day conversation. It's not something that we're like actively been tasked with fixing or trying to move the needle on. But, you know, Mother Nature, right? We've got one, right? We've got one planet. That's something that doesn't matter what space you work in, where you live, it's something that you should care about. And so when we think about how does IT impact the environment what are those what are those top things that you that you share with um the audiences when you have these talks like what are the what are the top two or three things that come to mind i always give a running list of things so like one is our use of data centers that's one the sure. other one is ai it uses a ton of electricity um, the other one is the use of plastic, like swag. Um, you know, it takes about 400 to 1,000 years to decompose, and that's in your shirts. That's everywhere. Um, you know, to uh, e-waste, such as like when you're trying to, you know, when you get, you're like, oh, the new iPhone came out or, oh, the mm -hmm. new laptop came out, and you go and you purchase that, and then you're like, what do I do with this parts? Um, that is something of concern. So e-waste also is there because there's rare like materials that are in there and how you get them is like mining through children in modern day slavery. So and I don't see that just openly blanket, but these are literally kids that have to go down these really thin tunnels to grab uh, whatever rare materials down there and bring it up. You need small hands, small bodies to do mining. That's not that's not okay. Um, a lot of these people mm. aren't paid. Um, and so it becomes one of those really concerning thing is that we don't even talk about where our things come from. And I think that's, that's like the first thing I try to get everyone to be aware of is like everything that you use, everything you touch, everything you buy, you have to understand where did it come from and having Absolutely. that awareness. And that's how we kind of start, you know, understanding you know, our own carbon footprint in some ways. No, those are, those are all great points. Cause for me, I was like data center. Yeah. That was my first, that was the first thing I thought of. Then you said swag. And I thought about how many pens, highlighters, random little hand sanitizers, <laughs> you know, you can just name it, right? Like stickers. You, yeah. Stickers. Like... You collect all of these things. You come back with like a little duffel bag situation full of things from every conference that you attend. I mean, you've probably collected thousands, right? I did it one <laughs> year and then I asked myself, did I need any of this? And then now ever since starting to do work in like climate change, 
I kid you not, I think like the very first few months I like changed everything. So like when it came to skincare, when it came to makeup, when it came to clothes, making sure that they were sustainably made, but also the workers were fairly paid. Yeah, that's a big, I mean, that's a big lifestyle change, right? It's like something that when you're going to switch to a more sustainable lifestyle, you gotta, you gotta take it and tackle it full on. So I think there's definitely more that we could talk about here. Um, you know, but listening to the, listening to this perspective, there's a few takeaways that I can already think of, like organizations can definitely implement. So I appreciate all of the insights. If you don't want the swag, say no. <laughs> That's an easy one, right? Yeah. That's an easy one. Or ask well, for sustainable swag. So such yeah, as like, can you get me swag. cotton t-shirts, like 100% cotton t-shirts instead right. of a mixture of cotton and Raylon or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there should be, there should be easy things without cutting, cutting, uh, you know, corners. And if the costs are too high, then we should be reconsidering whether these things are needed in the first place right yep. so um chloe something that i've always admired about you is just your involvement in the community your passion your ability to just like make an impact and then that's just like widespread i know that you've recently you know um delivered the chat with the diana initiative and i've been following that which has awesome been awesome work by the way um but the combating gender disparities in cybersecurity for marginalized genders really stood out to me I, I wish that I could have been there and listened to this talk. So now you're going to have to fill us in. Um, <laughs> but you delve into this intersectional challenge, right? Faced by individuals, recognizing the compounding factors of race, ethnicity, sexuality, disability. From your perspective and, you know, filling us into whatever you can from this talk, how can leaders make an impact to drive positive change? Would love to hear, you know, any, any little tidbits, any action that we can take and even not just from a leader, but like from a peer to peer perspective. Yeah, I think like the one thing I kept pushing on the entire talk, it starts with you. Because how you are out in the world, you could impact another person that could be positive, that could be negative, right? So if I don't keep myself in check, if I'm not, you know, willing to keep learning about different people's identities, or their backgrounds, then I'm part of the problem. Because I, I don't know about you, but I'm sure, Erica, you wouldn't want someone to just like look at you and come up with a bunch of stereotypes all over you, right? Yeah. And you know when you're being judged too. You get that sensation, you know? And so the thing I try to teach people in that particular conversation was the fact that we have to first examine ourselves, who we identify as. You know, you don't always have to put labels on everything, right? Um, but at least getting a sense of understanding who you are but also for you to learn and go out of your way to learn about others. Because I don't think a lot of people want to go out there and hurt others emotionally. Right. And so the best thing, and I think a lot of people that do it accidentally, they are not aware of it. So that's why it's, it's best for us to kind of work on ourselves and learn um, on our own and then ask questions. How can I be a better person? What, what are the things I don't know yet that I need to learn? And I think that's the most empowering thing that you can do for anyone and even yourself is to become aware of all these different backgrounds and celebrate them and also to be there to like hold their hand when needed or passing a mic to them when needed, but just being there to listen and without judgment. You make great points because the world would be really boring if we were all the same. Right? <laughs> Right. So part of that to me is, you know, celebrating like who we are, how we identify. Um, and, and this is this is something that's super important to me, you know, also being a female in tag, also being an immigrant, being Colombian, um, English being my second language, like something that's in the back of my mind is always like, you know, trying to seek to understand like who is Chloe beyond just a name, beyond what mm -hmm. I see on LinkedIn, right? Like what are those things that make you you and your uniqueness and all of those like beautiful things that you bring to the table, things that we can all learn from each other. And so I always I always try to do that, but I think we can always do better. And I think that we can always encourage others to try to understand where people are coming from. And then I love what you said about keeping in mind like how things come off is not necessarily 
the way that they were meant to be interpreted. And I think that that's yeah. so powerful in itself. Sometimes we're quick to to make judgment or to just take something and, and take it personally when it wasn't intended. So I, I love that. Yeah. And I think like when people have those moments too, it's usually kind of like, okay, time to check in with yourself. Why are you getting active here? What has happened here? Is this something, and always, you can always find someone, hopefully, that you can bounce it off, someone you can trust and be like, hey, I reacted this way. Was this the correct way to react to something like this? Or is this something I need to work on? And ask people, like people out there, ask them, you know, what is the best way? Um, and you got to be okay with understanding that you may have made a mistake, but that's what being human is, right? We got to make mistakes in this world. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, you know, you're never learning. And thank goodness for those people that tell us that we make a mistake and help us learn from the mistake and give us the feedback so that we can learn and be better and do better. Mm -hmm. So Chloe, um, we're coming at time, unfortunately, but that just means that I'm going to queue you up for our, for, for our next season, <laughs> hopefully get you locked in. Um, any new projects? I want to end on a positive note. Are there any new projects that you're working on? Anything that you want to share with our listeners? Yeah, if you're interested in getting involved in climate change, you know, reach out to me, DM. It might be something where, you know, more than happy to help or give any answers that I may know. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, if you're interested in getting to like Black Bounty right now in AI and ML, do check out Hunter. You shouldn't have imposter syndrome because no one's in it yet. And you have a place there. And if you need a good crowd, there is our Discord, which is a lot of fun. And last but not least, if you're looking a way to volunteer your time or you work for a company and you're thinking, oh, who should I you know, provide donations to? Diana Initiative is a wonderful organization and there's so much good stuff up ahead. And I am so excited and so thankful to be part of that team. Thank you, Chloe. And is LinkedIn still the best place to reach you? Yeah, LinkedIn, Twitter, or whatever they call it, X, the bird, anything. I'm also on Mastodon, Threads, Instagram. You can find me on anywhere. And I think my Amazing. DMs are all open. So yeah. Amazing. So I will put all your socials in the show notes. Chloe, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure having you back on the show. Oh, thanks for having me again. I'll see you next year. See you next year. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you learned something new and this story made you think, then share ITSP Magazine with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our columns. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.